Welcome back to our discussion of thermodynamics. So far we have had a triumphant path in that we were able to quantify temperature and furthermore we were able to connect the changes in temperature to uh, heat transfer. And the summary of that triumph is contained in this equation. That is, when we supply heat to a uh, substance of mass M with a specific heat capacity of C, we would expect to observe a temperature change delta T. However, there is a bit of a problem here. Actually, behind the scenes, we have made a very big assumption. The claim here is that we could get to any temperature when we supply the amount of heat. That is, if we were to supply an amount of heat, we could simply watch the temperature rise. Or if we extract the amount of heat, we could watch the temperature drop. However, we know in nature, most substances, actually all substances, have certain temperatures which are unique. And those temperatures, certain other dynamics begin to take, uh, take, uh, take effect. For instance, what happens when we reach a temperature where the object changes its phase, let's say from being a solid to a liquid, or from being a liquid to a gas, or the other way around, gas to liquid, or liquid to, to a solid. The point is, this equation has its limitation. Effectively, what we have done is we have assumed that this equation or rather the changes in temperatures we, in temperature we were going to look at are those uh, are, are ones that do not include phase change. Now, what happens if we reach the temperature where the object will begin to change its phase from one state to another? We need to account for this because this is an observed phenomenon in nature and thermodynamics is interested in uh, uh, describing such situations. Well, from experimentation, what we observe is that during a phase transition or a phase change, the temperature does not change whenever we transfer heat to the substance. This is very, very important. That when we reach a point of phase transition where the object is about to change, let's say, from being a solid to a liquid, the amount of heat we transfer to the substance is first spent to change the phase. Consider the example of ice. Suppose we have ice which is at zero degrees Celsius. That is, the ice is on the verge of uh, it's basically at, at its melting point. If we supply energy, the energy supplied to the ice will first be used to melt the ice. And while the energy is being used to melt the ice, there's no, more in the, 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 there's no energy available to change the temperature. That is why during a phase transition, the temperature remains the same. That is, while we're melting the ice, we will stay at zero degrees Celsius and until all the ice has melted. But once all the ice has melted, then any further energy we supply will therefore be used to change the temperature. This idea is very, very important, that when we get to a point of phase transition, energy will no longer be spent to increase the temperature, but rather it will be spent to change the phase. Once phase changes, the change of phase is complete, then any extra energy, any surplus of energy, will therefore be devoted to changing the temperature of the substance. I will try to explain this from, a, uh, from an atomic level. So let's consider a solid. You could, you could again think of ice. Uh, it's a very uh, common substance we're all familiar with, and we've seen ice melting from being a solid to, to a, a liquid. So typically solids have a regular and also a, a packed structure. 
at an atomic level. So let's suppose here is a, uh, an, uh, an atom at these uh, nodes. You have atoms of the same kind. doesn't matter what they are, but the point is they are of the same kind. It could be choose an element of your choice. But as a solid, the structure of it is usually regular. It's, it, it has some kind of a pattern. It has some kind of a crystalline form. Whenever you supply energy to such a structure, remember what temperature or what energy will do. It will cause a change in temperature. But remember what changes in temperatures do to the dimensions of an object. It will begin to expand. I should also mention that these kind of uh, uh, springs, are, they are meant to signify the connections. You could think of them as bonds. So here you have an atom that's bonded to another, and here you have another one bonded to another. That's how these regular structures uh, at atomic levels of solids uh, are formed. As we supply energy to such a, a structure, what happens is that these uh, atoms at these nodes will begin to vibrate and as we increase the temperature they will have more kinetic energy remember temperature is proportional to average kinetic energy so they will begin to vibrate more and more and effectively they will move away from one another so the separation will move away from one another effectively that means this spring this bond will become um, uh, the distance between the two will become larger and larger and larger. But then if you think of the bond as a spring, there comes a point where the spring cannot be stretched any further. That is, the spring has been stretched to its maximum. Any further supply of energy to stretch the spring will no longer actually stretch the spring, but rather what it would do, it would sever the spring. It will break the spring. The same is true with atoms, is that as you supply energy, what they do is they change their physical dimensions, that is, they expand and expand, and eventually so much so that the interaction between them, the potential energy between them, becomes weaker and weaker, and eventually this bond is broken. When we break this bond, or rather, um, uh, the bond... Um, gets broken or begins to get broken when we reach a point of phase transition. When we get to the point where the object is at its, uh, it's on the verge of transitioning phase, that's equivalent to this spring reaching its maximum length, and any further supply of energy is going to break this bond, break that bond, break that bond, uh, break that bond, and that bond, and that bond, all these bonds are going to be broken. So notice, any energy we are supplying at this point is not spent to cause these atoms to vibrate more, but rather it's spent to break these bonds. So that means at the point of phase transition, we do not have a temperature change. We, 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 temperature remains unchanged, uh, let's say, uh, at melting point, if we're going from a solid to a liquid. And once all the bonds have been broken, then any further supply of energy will therefore be spent to cause these atoms to move faster and faster. That's when temperature change can, that's when energy can therefore cause temperature change. I hope this illustration gives you a bit of a handle as to why during phase transition, no energy is devoted to changing the temperature, but rather it's devoted to changing the phase. That is, it's devoted to breaking these bonds. Okay. Now, how then should we quantify the energy associated to the phase change? Because clearly this does not depend on the temperature itself. Well, experimentally, what, we, what has been found is that uh, during phase change, there is what is called latent heat. This is a property of the substance in question. And over here, latent heat is defined, or rather is signified, 
by these letters L. Uh, LF corresponds to the latent heat of fusion. That is, fusion, uh, this, this refers to the, to the phase transition where we're either going from freezing or where we're either freezing or melting. These two states, uh, these two transitions are similar. If we are supplying energy, we would be melting, but if we're extracting energy, we would be freezing. So the interface where we're going from a solid to a liquid or from a liquid to a solid, that, that is, that's what we mean by fusion. The other interface is where we're going from a liquid state to a gas state, or you could think of it as boiling and condensing. That kind of energy that's associated with melting, I'm sorry, with boiling or condensing a uh, substance is known as the latent heat of vaporization. And over here we have a definition of it, uh, just a brief one, is that LF is the energy, that is the latent heat of fusion, is the energy required to change the phase of one kilogram of a substance. And I specify again that the phase change in question here is between solid and liquid. Suppose we don't, so uh, in order to find out how much energy we need to supply uh, to, let's say we have a sample of mass M, the energy we need to supply to melt that substance we, is going to be given by this. So QF is going to be the mass of our substance times the energy required to melt one kilogram. So my point is that this thing here, this is energy for one kilogram, but then we may not have one kilogram, we may have M kilograms. So we need to multiply this by M to give us the total energy of the particular substance we have at hand, or the particular sample of a substance we have at hand. Every object, every material has its own latent heat of fusion and also its own latent heat of vaporization. This is a property of the substance. Uh, later on, we will talk about an example of water. Okay. Now, the same goes, uh, actually there's a mistake here, that should be V. Uh, so, uh, that should be V, latent heat of vaporization. Uh, so the same goes when we are interested in the transition between liquid and gas. So if you are about to boil water, you need to supply this amount of energy. If you have m kilograms of water, you need to supply this amount of energy in order to cause the water to boil completely. So, this equation we started off with is very well trustworthy provided there is no phase change. However, if we encounter a phase change, what we need to use are these two equations. These are the ones that are applicable during phase change. Okay, over here I have a practical example. That is, we're going to begin with a, a block of ice. Right now it doesn't matter the details of how much ice it is, but think of it as just uh, one kilogram, if you if you we should rather think of how much ice there is. But the point is, we're starting off with a block of ice, which is initially at minus 10 degrees Celsius. We supply heat to this uh, block of ice. What is going to happen is that because the ice is not at its melting point, it's not at a point where it could uh, change phase, what's going to happen is it will first change its temperature. It will heat up from minus 10 degrees Celsius, and any heat we supply will cause a temperature change until we reach this temperature. This temperature for ice marks a melting point. Suppose we continue to supply energy to the ice. At this point, the temperature of the ice will not change. It will stay at zero degrees Celsius, but all the energy we are supplying will be spent to 
transition from being a solid to being a liquid. Consider the example we had earlier, the atomic view. That is, we are breaking the bonds between the molecules. Uh, and as that energy is being spent to break the bonds, this enables the ice to go from a solid to a liquid. And thus, when we get to this phase, uh, at zero degrees Celsius, this will be water at zero degrees Celsius, um, then any further energy we supply at this point would therefore be spent to uh, increase the temperature of the now liquid water. So we, if we keep supplying energy, the water will rise in temperature until it reaches another significant point, that is, the boiling point. And at this point, any further heat we supply, that heat will not be devoted to changing the temperature because this marks a phase change. Therefore, the heat we, we, we uh, pump into the water here will be spent to break the bonds between the wall, um, the liquid water molecules, and this is where we will therefore transition to a gas phase. And after all the after all the water has been converted to gas, has transitioned to gas, then any further heat supplied will cause therefore a temperature to rise further on. That's where you would have steam that's at a higher temperature. Uh, it could be 110, 120 degrees Celsius. But the point is. Now, the, temperature, the energy we supply will be spent to change the temperature of the steam. The same goes if we were extracting energy. Suppose we begin with a gas at 100 degrees Celsius, and this time around we're extracting energy. Of course, at 100 degrees Celsius, this would be the condensation or the point of, um, of condensing, right? This is where... The, uh, the steam would condense into uh, liquid. That is, all these water molecules, which were gas, they will therefore condense to be a liquid. And any more at extraction of heat will be spent to reduce the temperature, or rather, any extraction of heat will cause a reduction in temperature, so that temperature will decrease from a hundred all the way to zero degrees Celsius. And at zero degrees Celsius, if we keep extracting heat, what's going to happen is that the temperature will not change at this point, but rather uh, any heat we extract will reconnect, or rather will re-establish the bonds between the water molecules so that they form a regular structure. And when they form a regular structure, we recover the solid. And therefore, we would have a solid block of ice at zero degrees Celsius. If we keep extracting heat from this block of ice at zero degrees Celsius, then this will result into a reduction of temperature. What's important is that during phase transition, the temperature does not change the temperature stays the same. That's very important. And as an example, if we had a kilogram a block of ice and we supplied uh, the amount of energy required uh, to... Actually, I, maybe I should state it this way, that uh, for one kilogram of ice to be melted, we need to supply 334 kilojoules per kilogram. Suppose we had one kilogram of ice here. When the ice is at zero degrees Celsius and we supply exactly three, three, four kilojoules, what we're going to end up with is water. It's going to be liquid ice, but its temperature will be zero because this energy is just enough to break the bonds. But once we have exhausted this, there's no more energy to increase the temperature. So you would have ice, I'm sorry, water at zero degrees Celsius. It's very important if we supplied exactly this amount of energy to one kilogram of ice at zero degrees Celsius, 
the outcome is going to be liquid water at exactly zero degrees Celsius. And the same goes for uh, liquid water, which is at 100 degrees Celsius. If we supply 2430, 2430 kilojoules of energy, what we're going to get is a phase transition. It's the energy required to break the bonds of the liquid water so that it, it is able to transition to a gas phase. And I believe that's sufficient theory. For further reading, I commend you take a look at this section on OpenStax, the science book. And from here on, I want to do more exam uh, well, examples to demonstrate how we can apply the, these equations and this one.